Hello, this is Frank J. Avella with Awards Daily. Today in our Oscar Legends series, I have the pleasure of chatting with Leslie Manville. Throughout her career, Leslie has glided from stage to screen to television, delivering eclectic and powerful work. She was nominated for a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread and received a slew of awards and nominations for her performance in Mike Lee's Another Year. Leslie is a three-time Olivier Award nominee for her stage work, winning for her incredible performance in the revival of Ibsen ghosts in 2014. She will soon be enchanting moviegoers as the titular character in Anthony Fabian's delightful comedy, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you very much. A nice introduction. <laughs> Uh, Leslie, I noticed something when embarking on my Leslie Manville binge um, that I felt linked many of your characters. Uh, so many of them dare to show vulnerability. Uh, and many of your films also closely examine the complexities of relationships. I was curious, how do you go about choosing the roles you play? Oh, well, you know, the, the only power one has as an actor is to sort of say yes, please, or no, thank you to a script. Um, well, it's it really it really is all about the script. You know, if it isn't there on the page and it isn't it isn't rich, um, there's not there's not a lot you can do with it, however good a team you've got around you. Um, and I'm always looking to stretch the boundaries of of characters that I'm playing in terms of them being uh, different. I mean, I, I've, I've worked a lot, as you know, with Mike Lee, and I think because of the, um, uh, the variety of roles that I've done with him, um, I'm in a very fortunate place of never being pigeonholed, never being thought of as a, a one trick pony, which suits me fine. I like to be chameleon. I like to play, I love that I do Ada Harris on one hand and I'm doing Princess Margaret in the Crown on the other. You know, that that spectrum of social spectrum of those characters interests me. And within that, of course, um, given that everybody is a human being with a, a beating heart and a set of insecurities, whatever uh, class they are, <clears throat> um, uh, within those within those characters, there's always rich pickings. There's always something interesting to mine about what they what they might be what they might be going through. And obviously, some characters are some characters are more tortured than others. Some characters are going through grief. Some characters are riddled with insecurity. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting to find them and uh, uh, take on the challenge to play them, but. You know, ultimately, if those parts don't come to me, um, there's not a lot I can do about it. But fortunately, they do. And I also love the variety of um, uh, arenas for my performances. I love being on stage. I haven't been on stage for a while, not since 2020, mostly because of COVID. Um, but um, yeah, I just love flexing that muscle and miss it if I haven't done it for a while. Um, but yeah, I'm in a very good place at the moment and I'm, 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 I don't take that for granted or take it lightly or have any kind of arrogance about the situation that I'm in. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very pleased and very grateful and I continue always to work extremely hard. I, I'm never passe about the work and just sit back and think, oh, well, I'll come up with something. You know, I do, I do put in the hours and work very hard. My goodness, that was a long answer to a very short question. <laughs> that is okay. Well, you know, Mrs. Harris. Better make this a two hour interview, hadn't we? <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. Um, Mrs. Harris has so much depth to her. Um, she's a person willing to crawl out of her comfort zone and go on an adventure, opening se herself up to these possibilities. And that's not something we often see on screen. No, and she's, you know, it's, it, I, I like, there's, there's a kind of, there's not, something very no nonsense about Mrs. Harris, you know, she doesn't sort of overanalyze, she's not working out why she's doing things and questioning them, she's, she's very um, clear, she's a, she's a woman with great clarity, she wants this dress, and she needs to find a way to A, get the money, and B, get to Paris, and uh, and she's not flawed by any of it. You know, she she does see it as an adventure. And I, I love that about her, that she's it's 
she's up for the experience and whatever that experience is going to throw at her and you know the experience of you know meeting the the homeless guys in the station, the experience of meeting the, the Madame of Dior that Isabelle Huppert plays, um, of meeting the Marquis and going to his house for tea. And, you know, she just, she doesn't, she's, she's uncompromising in the fact that she is, that is her. She doesn't change herself to become something else to accommodate the environment that she's in. She is absolutely clear of who she is and uh, the world gets Ada Harris, and that's it. Like her generosity really floored me, especially when she lends her dress out later in the film. Something <laughs> extraordinary. I know, I know. She's yeah, she's she's a very very giving, big hearted bundle of love, really. I mean, she's she's a gorgeous she's a gorgeous character, and um, you know, I, I'm. I, you need to she needs to be that because she is takes you on this journey and you've got to you the audience have got to um warm to her and like her and 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 enjoy her kind of spark and feistiness and um uh and her innocence you know her innocence about the world is is charming and does lead to some quite nice comedy moments, you know. I mean, the brazen way in which she describes, and it's not a spoiler because it's on the trailer, but you know, the kind of sweet, uncomplicated way she describes Christian Dior is looking like her milkman, you know. It's just, it, she just says it as it is. It's, it's great. I, I'd like to go back and discuss um, some of your films now. Uh, you made your film debut in 1985, uh, Mike Newell's uh, Dance with a Stranger. You have that wonderful ladies' room scene, uh, <laughs> which, you know, you you basically stole the movie in that one scene. Oh, thank you. I, 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 I remember the scene, but I have to say I remember it vaguely. Um, uh, yes, I, yeah, with Joanne Wally and couple of other actresses. Yes, it, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and then you met Mike Lee, uh, which was a watershed moment for you because you became the actor he's worked with most, eight films, more than any other um, actor. Um, yes. yeah, tell me a little the... bit about that. Well, I met him when I was young. I was I I was uh, around about 22, 23. And up until then, I'd been working since I was 16. But I I didn't really have any sense of uh, what I wanted to do, really, as uh, as an actor. I didn't. I didn't even consider playing characters that weren't me. I mean, I was just playing myself. And then I met Mike, and we started working together. And honestly, we were just a match made in heaven. I completely got the kind of way he was working it made complete sense to me that if you weren't going to have a script you'd spend a long time creating your character and then you know through improvisations you develop what would become um a script it's just a different way of getting there rather than a writer sitting down on their own working for however long to come up with a script we do it with mike together and it's a it's a collaboration but it's all through character but the but the main thing he did for me was made me realize that I could play people that were absolutely nothing like me. And I absolutely loved that. I, I found it was so liberating. It was a real, pardon the cliche, it was a real light bulb moment for me. Um, you know, we, kept, we, we went on to work on many projects and as with his whole repertoire of actors, you know, Sometimes you you pay a big leading role in one of his films and sometimes it's just a cameo. And we all do that. You know, you've got Melda Staunton doing it in another year and then I'm playing a cameo in Vera Drake. And so it, it, it because the work is so interesting. I mean, I, I it's I always know that it's never it's not going to be dull and he's going to take me somewhere that I've not been before. And it's going to be a whole different character that nobody's seen me play before and uh yeah i i i just love it and we've done a play together as well um but I, he's it, it, he it is through him that 
this uh, range and variety of roles that that do pep does pepper my career. Uh, that that's why it's happened really. It's because he gave me all those fantastic uh, opportunities um, when I was starting out. Well, regarding one of those cameos in Secrets and Lies, uh, you you were a last minute replacement. You come in yeah. as the social worker and you were so good. Uh, honestly, I wanted an entire film just about her. Oh, yeah, it was it was an interesting one because uh, he had shot he'd shot the film already. Um, he'd completed it. He was editing. Um, and as soon as he called me up, I knew something was wrong because when Mike's making a film, he goes very heads down into a kind of tunnel, you know, so I wasn't expecting a kind of social call from him. And he said, look, I've shot the scene, but it isn't right. He shot it with a man, actually. I, I don't know who. But he said, look, I've got the money to reshoot it because it's such an important scene. It's the scene when Marianne Jean-Baptiste's character goes to the social worker to investigate the uh, her to find out her birth mother because she's been adopted. Um, so he said it's a crucial, pivotal scene and it needs to be right. So... I think we had about three weeks, which sounds like a lot, but you know, I, we 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 knew she had to be a social worker, so we and we knew what the scene had to fulfil in a kind of uh, basic way, information wise. So um, we we talked and we sort of created the character and sort of got her got her on the go, and then I went away for a week and did research, spent time with social workers who worked in adoption. And then I came back with Mike and Marianne, and then we started um, you know, working on the scene, improvising it, and then distilling it and sorting it all out. So you know, obviously when you shoot with Mike, you absolutely know what you're saying. You're never improvising on camera. You're not just making it up. I mean, you couldn't do that in a, in a you couldn't do that in terms of shooting it. It would be impossible. But um, Yes, she's a she 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 in my impression of social workers was very clear in the research I was doing. They were always needing to be somewhere else, you know, and they were always never getting a proper lunch break and all. So it it, it I was just really putting on screen what I'd observed in the in the research and uh, um people seem to love the the moment with the Rolo chocolates. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a marvelous but, moment. It, it, it's yeah it is it is it's a it's a good scene and i'm i'm very uh, i'm very i'm very proud of it and i'm very fond of that film it's it's one of mike lee's great films uh, and uh, speaking of one of his great films, I think another year is as well. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about Mary. Um, she mm -hmm. has a line in the film that destroyed me. Um, Why do I always get it wrong? And it's almost a defining line for her. Uh, I yeah. loved Mary. I love Mary too, and I, I and when I yes, I think that uh, Mary uh, touched me in in many ways, and I I I think about her often. Uh, I can almost it's like she's somebody that I can see sitting next to me, you know. Um, and and a lot of people said to me afterwards that they that they either said, "Oh, I know somebody who's like Mary," or "I've had times in my life when I've." felt like Mary. I think the problem is with Mary in another year is that Mary is like that all the time. And I think that we have all had times in our life when we've been lonely, desperate, thinking nobody will ever love us, being chaotic. You know, we've had that in passing, but the problem with that Mary is that she couldn't escape those feelings. You know, she was, she was riddled with loneliness and insecurity. Um, and just didn't know how to take care of herself. I mean, she was clearly somebody who just shouldn't have drunk that much, you know, when you've got all of that pain going on, you know, the last thing you should be doing is, is um, self-medicating with alcohol. Um, but she's, it, she's so, it's such a, she's such a touching woman that you just do want to, Put your arms around and take care of her and uh you know nobody was doing that in her life and um it's yeah it's it's painful but yes i i, I 
uh, she's up there for me as one of the things I've loved doing the most. So, so real. Um, another game changer for you was uh, Cyril Woodcock in Phantom Thread. Yeah. Uh, tell me about getting that call from Paul Thomas Anderson and what the experience is like now looking back. Well, I remember the call very vividly because uh, my agent rang me the day before and said, Paul Thomas Anderson's going to phone you tomorrow at 11 a.m. And I couldn't quite believe that, but um, I didn't know him at all. Um, and I thought, oh, well, he won't call or he'll forget or he'll call at three o'clock and 11 o'clock on the dot, he called. And uh, we had a great conversation and he said, look, I'm going to be sending you a script. I'm going to post it or FedEx it. He said, I don't want to email it because he didn't trust emails leaking, I suppose. Um, so I anxiously waited for this script for a few days. And then he said, I'll give it a read and give me a call, you know, when you've got a minute. <laughs> As if it was all kind of not important and blasé. So, of course, I completely devoured the script when it arrived and um, called him immediately. And um, and he said, well, look, I'm I'm coming over to England with Daniel in a couple of months. So let's let's all get together and have um, dinner. So I said, great. And then I called my agent back and she said, what? Well, well, is it, you know, is it yours? I said, oh, well, actually he didn't, he didn't say, but he said he's coming over in a couple of months with Daniel and let's have dinner. So then I was still thinking, well, is it, is the part mine or what? And then he sent me this email saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I hope you haven't had a terrible weekend. I forgot to say the part's yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was just, I mean, heaven, heaven. And that was good seven months before we started. So, um, and needless to say, that dinner was fantastic. The three of us just got on one of the great nights. I mean, there I was in London, hanging out and getting to know these two amazing men. So it was just wonderful. And, you know, that shoot was really 14 of the best career weeks of my life. And, um, I loved every minute of it. I adore both of them. Um, and I, the legacy of that film for me obviously has been, it's opened some doors, you know, and getting an Oscar nomination opens doors. It just, it just does. I, I, and I, 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 I don't think that's just a kind of, um, a fickle thing you know I think the I think the film is a brilliant brilliant film um and it's uh it, it's Cyril you know the what Paul wrote for me to do and what we created between us in Cyril was uh was an in was an, a, a kind of she's a fascinating woman you know you can't really quite get to her um you you just don't know what's making her tick it's a She's very, very um, held and complicated, tight. Um, but I, I, I absolutely loved it, and um, of course, it's 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 um, opened opened lots of doors. Um, I mean, I've had a, I have a great career in 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 the UK, and um, that's that's enough for me, truly. But. Um, I'm I am delighting in some of the American opportunities that are coming my way now. But, you know, I, I will keep judging offers as I've always judged them, you know, how good the project is, how interesting it is, how good the part is. You know, I'm, I'm not going to suddenly um, lower my standards just because I'm being offered something in America. You know, that my same rigid standards will apply. But um, I'm very, I'm so happy to have made that film. And, um, you know, anybody who doesn't know Paul Thomas Anderson, you know, you need to know that he is truly one of the world's loveliest men. There's nothing pretentious about him. Um, he's just a lovely human being. Can you um, share a little bit about what the Oscar experience was for you? Well, it was brief because I was doing Long Day's Journey into Night in the in the West End, and we were doing Sunday performances. We were, you know, sort of doing the American method of doing a early um, uh, a late matinee on a Sunday, 
and then you have Monday off and you're back on on Tuesday, which is nice. But of course, the Oscars are on a Sunday. Um, I couldn't go on the Saturday. The producers really didn't want me to not do the two shows on Saturday. I mean, we were we were sold out and I understand that. And it's such a huge role. And of course, people that have paid for tickets on a Saturday, uh, if I was ill, it's a different thing. But I kind of felt to say she's not on because she's going to the Oscars is a bit. Anyway, so I couldn't go on the Saturday. So what they did agree to do was cancel the Sunday matinee and put us in an extra Wednesday matinee. Fine. So on the Sunday morning, um, the flight directly from London to L.A. was leaving too late. I wouldn't have got there in time for the ceremony. I mean, thank God there's an eight hour time difference between London and L.A. So you're traveling backwards in time. So that helped. But so I had to fly to Amsterdam, which is going in the wrong direction because they had an earlier flight to L.A. So I had two hours sleep that night because I knew I had to arrive with clean hair. So I had to get all that on the go, Uh, flew with my son to Amsterdam, had this crazy chase across Amsterdam airport because we were nearly going to miss the L.A. flight, got there with an hour and a quarter to get ready whole team was there you know makeup hair nails dress <laughs> um absolutely loved the whole mad crazy experience um and then slept one night and came back the next day and did the show <laughs> oh my god <laughs> wow that well so, you know i i it's it was it was it was i did it though i absolutely did it so you know it's uh it's doable, but it wasn't ideal. But I had a great night. And, you know, Paul and Maya, his wife, and um, Johnny Greenwood was there. And I was there with my sister and my son. And we we didn't do all the parties. We, we just didn't. Not really any of our scene, really. But what we did was better. We went off to this really nice hotel and we found a quiet lounge and we had cocktails and omelettes and it was it was just it was great it was great I really didn't want to be at big crowded parties doing small talk all evening so we went and had a quiet evening and did great big talk (laughs) (laughs) that's lovely um ordinary (laughs) excuse me ordinary love which was the last time we spoke. Um, extraordinary film about ordinary people and and this great chemistry you had with uh, Liam Neeson. It's just a gem. Mm. Yes, yes, I'm very fond of that film. And a lot of women who have been through breast cancer uh, said to me how much the film meant to them because it 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 was very, a, it is a film about a couple and what it what going through breast cancer and the trials of that and the difficulty and the pain of all of that what it does to a really solid relationship you know it's inevitably going to um a rocket in some ways um so uh, but a lot of women said to me they found it a really positive film about breast cancer because it it did show truthfully what it does to a relationship and how difficult it is to navigate um and you know it did it didn't it didn't sentimentalize it in any way i mean there's some very difficult scenes in that film um you're watching these people exposed to this horrendous uh, thing that's happened to the to the woman and the fear of it and are you ever, are you going to live uh, is your life ever going to be the same again? Are you ever going to be able to have the sort of simple pleasures that they had before? And, and it's also a very, it's very beautiful. I mean, the, the scene that they have when the night before she's having, going in to have a mastectomy, it's, it's very, very beautiful because, you know, it's the last time she's going to have breasts. And it's a really stunning scene about how much he loves her and loves her body, but knows that it's never going to look the same again. And it's, it's, it was so sensitively written and shot. And, you know, Liam and I, we just, 
instinctively and organically just found it with those two people you know it's very hard to suddenly one day you, you're working with this person who you don't know very well and you've got to create this 30-year relationship yeah. um and then they just say and action you think all oh, right okay 30 years of history with this person but you know we just we're easy with each other and um so it, it's that one of the loveliest films i've i've made and obviously are really lovely um uh speaking of like contrasts blanche in let him go <laughs> such a fantastic role she's frightening and brutal and i didn't recognize you initially when i first saw it how did you get inside that character oh god um i kind of just I mean, all credit to Tom Bazooka, the director, because he really held out for me. I think there was some reluctance on behalf of the um, of the producing team, and I really don't blame them, you know, because there's plenty of American actresses who could play that role. But he he really wanted me to do it, and he held out for me, and all, all credit to him. I just kind of knew how to play her. And there's something quite theatrical about her, and and he, and certainly Tom shot it that way. You know, you you may not remember, but the first time you see her, she's in the kitchen, and she's it's quite dark, and Kevin Costner and Diane Lane are arriving to get their grandchild back, and he had me kind of slightly invisible in the dark with a with standing up with the table lamp kind of shielding me and then you just see this glow of a cigarette and you know she's got one of the best opening lines I've ever had to say which is I hope you like pork chops <laughs> <laughs> and she just kind of lowered down from underneath this lamp and looked at them with this cigarette and there's some there was just something very theatrical about her and um you know that that big scene when they arrive which is really a long scene where she kind of performs for them really i mean it is blanche giving a performance of blanche um so it lent itself to a to a certain kind of heightenedness you know small didn't want to go too far but i think in comparison to the rest of the character although certainly Ke kevin and diane you know their characters were really much more much more low key so i didn't have to go too high with her for her to look kind of heightened above what they were doing anyway but I absolutely loved it and really really enjoyed working with Kevin and Diane who who um were so supportive because you know I was I was coming into it and uh, they'd been shooting for a while and you've got to come in and just kind of deliver this woman and um I'm not scared about doing that, by the way, and, and that is because of my, I know it's because of my theatre experience, you know, I just kind of went on there and wasn't shy about it, and I just kind of went, wham, here she is, this is what I'm going to do with her, and they were all rolled with it, and it was, it was fantastic, and they were incredibly supportive, you know, Kevin was just, just lovely. Um, so I, yeah, that that was that was a good few weeks filming. I absolutely loved it. I'm sounding like I love absolutely all of it, but <laughs> I have really loved playing these people. You know, this great range of people. It's been wonderful. That's a really good thing. And and you've crossed mediums so often: film, theater, TV. Can you speak a little bit about what challenges you artistically from from these mediums, um, and where you feel most comfortable? Oh, well, I think I, I got comfortable with film later in my life um, because I think film is a difficult one, really. Um, and, and also my early years were mostly on stage. So I'm very comfortable on stage. I, I, I love it. I mean, obviously, there are lots of different technical demands. And I do think it is the ultimate challenge for an actor. And there's no hiding place. You cannot be edited around. You cannot be made to look better than you are it's very exposing the audience can look at you for the whole evening if they choose to and you've got to be in control and on it you know it's your responsibility and i love that about it um film is 
I'm comfortable on, on film now, unquestionably, but it, it was a much slower burn, really much slower. And I had some, I remember part of the starting to feel comfortable was fantastic conversation I had with Helen Mirren. This is some time ago now, 20 years plus probably. We did a, uh, we did a television uh, film together playing sisters. And she was talking about how long it had taken her to get really confident and comfortable on film. And this thing about, yes, you're playing the scene with another person, but then there's this camera and that uh, what you're doing to that person there has got to be got to be absorbed by this camera here. And it's a, it, it's just about that relationship, really, with the camera um, and how you relay what it is you're trying to feel so that the camera understands it. Um, but yes, much a much slower burn with filming. But that that's yeah, that's no bad thing. Well, Leslie, this has been such a privilege. I have 10,000 more questions for you, but unfortunately we're out of time. I know you're coming up in The Critic, The Crown as Princess Margaret and yes. Dangerous Liaisons. Uh, yes. Very excited about all of those. So as a final wrapping question, um, what, what do you want to share about any of those? Um, well, The Crown, we've already shot season five. I'm about to start doing season six. Uh, there's not a lot I can say about that, but, um, you know, it's Princess Margaret. So hooray, what a great, what a great woman to um, get my acting chops around. It's, that's been uh, terrific. Dangerous Liaison is, is a glorious, big period piece about this a, a, a extraordinary story in, in French in French history, um, wonderful. And Mertoy is, uh, is, is, is a glorious, difficult, complicated um, uh, woman seeking revenge and exploring her, her huge hunger for sex. It's very, very interesting role. Um, and what was the other one? Oh, The Critic. Yes, The Critic is, uh, I've done The Critic. It's, um, I have a nice cameo in that written by my friend, Patrick Marber, who's a brilliant writer. Um, and it's a it's a wonderful film. I mean, the stars of that film are Ian McKellen and uh, Gemma Arterton. So uh, it's their piece, really. And I just give a little a little delicious nugget. Well, I, Leslie, I look <laughs> forward to seeing you. For. Yes, I look forward to seeing you in so many other things. And I did see you in Long Day's Journey when you came to BAM oh. here in New York. Uh, and it was extraordinary. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. I didn't notice you're wearing the T-shirt. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for Thank your you time. Frank. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.